If you've spent much time on my channel, you know that every year I do analysis videos on the Formula One cars as they get released by each team. And to do that effectively, I need to know in great detail what the aerodynamic rules are. Now, in order to do that, I need to have regulations boxes of what the volumes are that you can put aerodynamic parts in. However, this isn't something you can just get unless you have access to the FIA CAD portal. So in this video, we're going to go through the process of creating the rules boxes from the written definitions in the rules from scratch. Drawing a rules box is annoying, but if you don't go through the long process, it's hard to truly understand the rules. Now, I could just grab a random box that someone's done off the internet, but there's no way for me to verify this quickly to make sure that those sets of boxes would be accurate, and also I wouldn't get the learnings as I'm going through the process. I also wouldn't get a nice parametric model that I could modify at a later date if the rules were to change, or if I wanted to move around some of the planes in the rules and see what happens. So here we are. You're about to watch me use a $40,000 piece of software to play Join the Dots for seven hours. So to start with, you need to set up a bunch of fundamental planes. You basically are going to have a front axle plane, which I'm going to define at x equals zero, rear axle plane, a differential plane, a PU plane, a front impact structure plane, and XC, which is a plane that we're going to talk about a little bit more later. And then we can go and put those planes in place and we can set up the out of bound of the car. So what defines your legality spaces is a bunch of volumes or reference volumes at the end of the rules. I'm going to be mainly looking at the aerodynamic volumes. I'm going to be ignoring some of the power unit volumes that are important there. So most of these volumes are defined by some sort of surface where you basically join the dots and then you go through and extrude that surface between two defined planes. Uh, and then you do some form of cutting or trimming action on the surface. What I'm doing right now is I'm working on that sort of outer barge board area and the foot and the vertical in that region there. I've gone a little bit off the chronological order in the rules for this, but I'll get back on the chronological order shortly. So now I'm basically copying one of my existing geometries because I know it will fit in a different area. So I'm using what's known as a power copy. I'm basically adapting the outer barge board foot area here to be the volume for the sort of keel front section, the bib it's called in the rules. Now I'm going and constructing the main floor volume. Now this is one of the more complex volumes on the car, and you'll see why as I draw this out. It's got a very specified shape that's a bunch of straight lines, which is a little bit confusing when it feels like some of them they could have just used arcs to define it, or maybe even define it a little bit less constrained. Uh, but you basically have this low plank region, and then you've got a chamfered region with a fillet between them. Now again, I just don't see why they needed to make this such a constrained region. I don't think it really affects the performance of the following cars and they're still going to get a step reference plane like they did on the old rules, but hey, whatever they want to do is what they're going to do. So then we take this full volume and we cut out a section from the top of it defined by a surface. We move everything above the surface, which is a common theme, and we slice the front end with a plane at the front. And then we've got our basically center floor section. We now need to build the outer floor section. So this is going to be all the bits in the outer region. Now, what I'm creating now is a cuboid. This is a really common thing in the rules. They use this axis aligned cuboid, they call it. Uh, it's, it comes up all the time. It's basically, you've got to make a box that's defined by a diagonal, and they use those boxes to add or remove material all over the place. So I've made an axis aligned cuboid, I've trimmed it, and then I remove it from the floor. And that defines basically the diffuser outboard geometry. Now we have to define basically the tunnel removed volumes, like the volume that we're removing below the floor, so where the diffuser tunnel is going to come through. They basically are specifying a minimum diffuser volume here. Again, I don't super see the purpose of specifying a minimum diffuser volume. Teams are going to go fairly high within the diffuser. I guess they're trying to stop any weird strake-like geometries coming down in this region. Uh, but it is just a bit of an odd one to, to mandate so specifically. Like back in the rules when I was working on the cars, we had the ability to go down in the diffuser region, but we pretty much never did apart from the strakes. So again, just feels a little bit weird to put in. I know they're interested in keeping the wake clean for the car behind in the center, so that's probably why they're doing it, but still a bit odd. So now we've got to define the diffuser sidewall. So there's the area that obviously any side part of the car can go down to. We've got a bit more axis line cuboid work going on. Then we've got another axis line cuboid at the floor leading edge to give us our floor leading edge device. 
switching out now to a new volume. So now we're going to start looking at the bodywork with the floor complete. So the bodywork again is defined in a little bit of a strange manner. You've got this giant cylinder that you have to make, and then you have to go and do the, the intersection between that cylinder and a nose shaped geometry. So that's what you can see here. Uh, it's a little bit of a weird way to define it, but I guess it gives them a sort of rounded top to the box, which I guess is what they're after. Previously, they had straight lines and then arcs, uh, but this is a more continuous curve. So obviously a bit of an aesthetic choice there. Then we just go to the rear and define the, the rear chassis geometry, which is not super different this year compared to last year. And one of the things with this rule set is there's a lot of super arbitrary planes in it. You can already see in my drawing how many random planes are stacking up. And these create a whole bunch of different reference heights. I don't know why they weren't a little bit more consistent with that. It feels like, again, they were over constraining the geometry pretty hard. But then what they do in this phase is you go and you cut out the vertical profile of the bodywork and that gives you your main bodywork volume. You then have to split that into a front, mid and rear zone, which obviously they'll discuss different rules for in the rules section. There's then a definition for the min volume at the front of the chassis. I assume there's going to be the minimum volume allowed in here. And there's another one that has quite a constrained rules definition. You have to make a series of arcs. So you're basically making a bunch of, of circular volumes and then you're sweeping them along some lines with some kinks. And then you have to fill it all the corners when you're done here. So you'll make these big arcs, sweep the surfaces, intersect the surfaces with a, a vertical surface and then make a fillet. And that's how you make this volume here. And again, like it's a fairly convoluted and precise way of doing something that feels like it could be a little bit less constrained without really any consequence on whether or not one car would eventually develop a superior aerodynamics platform to another. But that's the way they've decided to do it. Now we get into some of the simpler stuff. So this is just the, the mirror going along. It's a very simple reference volume, not dissimilar to what it's been previously. This here is the driver cooling intake. Again, it runs on that similar sort of cylindrical intersection as the main bodywork. Basically, we're going to intersect an axis lined cuboid with a giant cylinder, and that's going to give us our region that we can put a driver cooling inlet scoop. We're now going to move back to the uh, engine cover and the side pod. So the side pod is basically a section right at the front of the side pod. It's, it's not actually the whole side pod. The side pod volume is just sort of the side pod inlet at the front. Uh, and then we've got the EC volume or engine cover volume, which is your main side pod that goes rearwards. And then obviously we're going to have the main engine cover in the center as well. You can see me growing the central engine cover region here. And so again, I have to do an extrude and grow across. Then I have to go and cut this engine cover down to size so that we have a workable volume here. And then I have to go and add a region that's going to be the shark fin area. You can see it's got this kind of slope down and then this kick out the rear. Add it to my list of hugely constrained items for what it is. And then you basically go and merge all these volumes that you've defined and that forms the main EC volume. That's where you can put all that type of bodywork in. We then have to define the aperture volume. So RV, BW aperture. This is essentially where you can go and put louvre records and things like that in the bodywork. So that's just a, a multi-sided polygon that we then extrude in one direction. So you can see that here. And then the rules move a little bit further rearwards towards the tail. So this is basically where the gearbox rear impact structure is. Uh, you may recognize this shape on the back of previous cars. It's a pretty common shape. You basically have the rear impact structure sitting out the back and then it goes into the gearbox further along. So this has a bit that you slice out and intersect and that gives you that shape there. We then use another one of our axis line cuboids to make a tailpipe volume. Here I'm just doing a little bit of house cleaning and going through and tidying up my tree so that I can reference all my volumes a little bit better once we reach the end of this project. So I'm basically getting each volume and moving it into my final output volumes folder or geometrical set. And then we had to move on to the front wing, which there's a lot going on with these front wing reference volumes. We start with by defining the main box that the wing elements sit in. So we basically have to work out this plane that goes across the front of the front wing. We have to generate this multi-sided polygon, which gives you an idea of where our front wing elements are going to sit. In many ways, this isn't dissimilar to the shape of the previous rules. It's just a little bit smaller. And one of the things that's more unique about this set of rules is that we have a sort of wheel-shaped cutout 
trimming most of the, the rules boxes on the front wing. So we get this wheel looking cylinder and then we trim all our little sub volumes with that. And each one of those sub volumes is generally defined off an axis line cuboid like always. And then we trim it with a, a plane that goes across the front wing and we trim it with that rear wheel volume. And you can see there's a lot of different volumes going on in here because there's a lot of different devices on the front wings, but each one now has its own little volume bit. That front wing end plate outer has a lot of stuff going on on it but you can see that it's very heavily regulated what devices you're allowed, where they can be, uh, and you don't really have much scope for deviating outside those boxes. There's also some small items like sensors, stays, things like that, that have their own smaller rules boxes. And those boxes are defined at the origin and then you just translate it to wherever you want your device to sit. So you can see here, I'm drawing up one of those sensor reference volumes. And this is obviously at the origin, but in reality, you would go and stick this somewhere like the end plate, front wing, something like that. And that would give you a spot that you're allowed to put your sensor in. This is to stop you having ridiculous sensors that are also aerodynamic elements. Now we're just going to generate the front camera volume. Again, axis line cuboid, go in and trim it with a cutter. And then that will give us our volume that we can stick the front camera in. Now, after that, we get to move to the rear wing. Now the rear wing, much like the front wing, has shrunk down since last year. And what it is, is we've got a volume that is an axis line cuboid, if you will, that then has a trim on the bottom end of it. This is where the rear wing profiles are sitting. And then we have to go and draw a rear wing end plate volume along the side of it. Now, one of the things that you'll notice in this rule set is there's no beam wing volume because there's no intent to have a beam wing. And we'll get to the volume later that we are going to have as a mechanical stay to the rear wing, but the beam wing is gone for this year. So you can see we cut around that rear wing and we end up with this shape for the rear wing end plate box here. You can see that as we've been going along, the thing has been slowly looking more and more like a car. We then have a very constrained volume for where the rear wing pylons have to sit. And if you notice that this is gonna constrain us to a two pylon rear wing strategy, it's not gonna be like back in the day where you could have a single pylon or a double pylon. Now, halfway through drawing up this rules box, the FIA did what they have a tendency to do, which is update the rules. This meant they had to go through and check everything I'd drawn so far and make sure that everything I'd done was going to be compliant with the new rule set. Thankfully, they highlight everything in purple, but there's still a bunch of stuff to check. One thing that's a new volume is they added this RV floor corner volume. Now, what they do in that sense is they actually cut down a little bit of the rear floor volume down to flatten it out, and they've added this new floor corner box. Now, my understanding from just having a skim of the main rules is that this box for the, the rear corner is somewhere where we can put a winglet geometry or something like that. Whereas previously, I think it was more likely that you would only get a curl there. And that's probably why they gave the extra height in that floor region. Checking the rules gave me a good opportunity here to also add in the plank volume properly. Previously, when I'd drawn it up, I didn't actually have the plank volume resolved. Whereas now I have this plank, as you can see here. Now this covers all of the explicitly defined volumes, but that is not the end of the story. There's another set of reference volumes, which are all defined by just an axis aligned cuboid or multiple axis aligned cuboids. And these particular volumes, we have to generate just as well. So this adds more time again. And even though these volumes are simple, there are a lot of them. So we need to go through and generate each one. This gives me a logical pause for a quick pitch for my FlowViz course, which I've just released. It covers all the theory and practical aspects of how to make, apply, and interpret FlowViz using all the skills that I learned in Formula One and then perfected through my consulting work. There's a limited time launch sale on right now. So you go over to courses.jkfaero.com and check out the course there. You can find out more and enroll in the course. So back to the stay bracket support and fairing reference volumes. Now that's this big list that we were talking about before. And we're just going to go through each one of those cuboids and draw them out. Now these are technically all for stays and fairings of devices. So we've got things like the mirror stays. We've got things like the barge board stays, the front wing pylons. We also have the active aero adjusters, which I believe are referred to as SLMs. So we've got those volumes to find in here, both the volume for the actuator itself. So we've got a linkage volume that we can translate to wherever. And then we've got a volume for where the actual actuator is allowed to sit. 
Then with all those done, it's all over, right? We've all got this sorted. We've done every single volume. Not quite. There's now a series of reference surfaces that we need to cover. So the volumes show us where we can put our geometry in. The reference surfaces usually have something in the rule where you have to meet something with respect to a reference surface. For example, you may have to completely shadow a reference surface. You may have to make sure that the reference surface is fully visible or not visible or fully covered. Now at this point, I was pretty frustrated of joining dots, so I wanted to see if I could just get a macro to quickly do it. However, I realized that a lot of these definitions of these reference surfaces, they are with respect to XF and XR. So that's the front wheel axis and the rear wheel axis. So there's a bit of complexity to them, some of them with respect to XC. Uh, the formatting of the table doesn't really easily just go into software. We need to do some OCR, and then you've got to filter out all the data from the rules. And I figured by the time that I'd worked out scripts and cleaned all the input data, gotten all my macros working, I probably could have just done all the surfaces myself. So that's what I did. I just went through and I drew up all these surfaces all on my own. Much like the main bodies, there's nothing too exciting about these surfaces. Each surface is defined by a series of points. You draw lines between the points, and then you fill between those lines, and that creates your reference surface. Some of these surfaces are for things like the floor or the floor foot, where we're obviously going to have to have a shadowing requirement. There's other bits that are for things like apertures or protection surfaces for the ERS. So each surface gets referenced in the rules later on, but we need to have these surfaces even if we're not going to strictly look at them from an aerodynamics perspective straight off the bat. Now, again, in preparing these reference surfaces, I'm leaning heavily on my power copying and basically making sure that I can draw these as fast as physically possible because I don't want to be spending more time than I absolutely have to on these areas. Now, you can see here that with the reference surface I made from the nose, I just got one point at the wrong axis definition, so I basically put two of the points referenced off the, the wrong reference plane, the reference origin system, and this completely made my nose shape wrong. Now, it was one of those things where when I went back and looked at it later, it was pretty obvious that this was not how the surface was meant to be, but it just shows you how easy it is to make a mistake when doing these regs boxes and how you have to just go and use a bit of common sense and also just thoroughly check your work to make sure that you are actually putting in the correct points so that you're getting the correct outcomes. Again, just doing a little bit of housekeeping and making sure that all the surfaces are all nice in one geometrical set so I can go and get a good reference on them later on. One thing that definitely was going to be more useful to have a macro for and was going to be something that could actually be done easily was to get an automated and randomized coloring for each one of my reference surfaces and volumes. Now, when I was in F1, I used to use randomized coloring fairly often. Since F1, I generally tend to color things manually, so I've never really needed this particular functionality. But with a bit of help from AI, because let's be real, who wants to code in VBA? I was quickly able to whip up a macro that would automatically randomly change all the colors of the selected bodies that I had. There you go, that gives us our finalized regulatory volumes that we can use for analyzing the rules and regulations, and we can also use for our launch analysis next year. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is going to be the first of a series on these new 2026 F1 rules and how the car's going to be next year. Throughout the rest of this year, I'm going to be taking a look at how these regs compare to the old regulations, what it means for the cars, what potential aerodynamic opportunities there are for the teams, and how the airflow is going to work on these new cars. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see next from me, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.